Baptist Church here in beautiful Sandusky, Ohio. I'm delighted that you're able to join together here in the auditorium and around the campus and online today, worshiping the Lord together. Whether you're at home or here or in one of the remote classrooms around, take advantage of the opportunity to sing your praise to the Lord on this another Resurrection Sunday. Every week of the year, we come to this first day of the week and the church's recognition of the resurrection of our Savior. But at this time of year, uh, we love to be able to combine the thoughts of the incarnation and the resurrection all together on Sundays. So let's join together singing, This is Amazing Grace. Would you stand with me, please? And let's sing to the Lord.
you just take this moment, just kind of um, silence your heart and focus your heart and mind on the Lord and our privilege and opportunity to gather in his name for his glory. Lord, we intentionally put aside the cares of this life, all the pressures and stress that go with just daily living. And we intend to focus on the truth of your word, to read it, to understand it, to see its application to our lives and to put it into practice. Lord, I pray that we would have a, the, the mindset of ministering one to another, even just in our casual conversations to encourage each other and to know each other better so we know how to pray for each other and even reach out in, in love for each other in practical ways all during the week. I thank you for the sense of family and connection and belonging that we have as fellow believers together. Cultivate that among us today, Lord, I pray. And then use our offering that we give today, Lord, to carry out the gospel message all around our community and even all around the world. I think of Rob and Rinda Hayden, our missionaries, living there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but helping with uh, Horizon International School that online education for national pastors in many languages all around the world, national pastors being trained theologically for their spiritual leadership of churches. And I thank you for uh, Rob's expertise and his availability to give his whole life to see that the curriculum is accurate and well received and the platform is available and your gospel's going forward as a result. And I thank you that we could partner together with them and with many other missionaries that our offering today is local and global all at the same time. So, Lord, it's your work and your church. Uh, all over the world, we know that there's a sense of connection, really, to all the believers all over the world. But we gather here together with these other ones, and we pray that our fellowship would be sweet and beneficial one to another. We come for your honor and glory today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take a moment, please, to welcome one another, and then you may be seated. We're so glad you joined us this morning, and we anticipate the Lord working because he has promised to start a work, and he's going to finish it. So we're all a work in progress, aren't we? We haven't got there yet, and the Lord's been working on all of us, but he's a faithful, good God. He never gives up on us. So thank you for making this a priority to worship together this morning. We are rejoicing with Mike and Rachel Morrow at the birth of their baby boy, December 2nd. His name is Joshua Isaac, a good name. <laughs> so we're, we're thankful for the, for the addition to the Morrow family. And uh, we just continue to pray for now. Now we pray for Joshua. We make the list a little longer. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> we also pray for Lucy Garman, her sister Lily passed away on December 2nd, and pray for comfort for this family in their time of sorrow. The Echo teen group is going to be Christmas caroling a week from today at 5 o'clock, and uh, if there's a sign-up in the Echo room, if you'd take a moment to do, to do that, uh, sign up for that. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we're glad you're here as well, and we'd take a moment to fill out that card, and on the back side is an opportunity for you to let us know about any prayer requests that you might have. And uh, WMU Craft and Devotional and Prayer Night is coming up on the 14th at 6 o'clock, and they're doing a little craft. That you can see some of those crafts out there at the table to the right as you go out, and if you'd like to be a part of that, 
Uh, that would be great. Good opportunity. And Christmas candlelight service. Yes, Christmas is coming. Uh, the goose is getting fat. <laughs> Won't you please put a penny in the old man's hat? I'm, I'm not talking about me. You know. <laughs> Just saying. Where's Pastor? He was going to say it. I knew he was going to say it, so I thought I'd say it. But Christmas is coming, and it's not about Santa. It's about the Savior. And I encourage you to keep Christ in Christmas this season. Keep the priority of uh, the Lord and opportunity to share the good news with others. That candlelight service is a great opportunity to invite people to come. It's going to be a good night to sing the carols that you enjoy singing and just point others to Christ. So make that a priority, would you please? And then our verse for the month is found in Galatians, and it's up here on the board. So let's, uh, let's say it together. It's a new month, and it's a new, new message from God's Word from Galatians 4, 4, and 5. Let's say it together. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. We're adopted into the beloved through the work of Jesus Christ. He not only came, but he came for a purpose. He came to seek and to save us who were lost. I'm thankful for that. When the, when the wise men came to found Jesus, and then they entered that house, their first response was to bow down and worship. And we worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This song encourages us to do that. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. Let's sing it this morning. Let's stand. All right. No! 
remain standing, please, as we read God's word together. Lots of singing during this time of year, and then the birth of Christ, there was no exception as people sang. Mary had a song. <laughs> she sang, my soul magnifies the Lord. You sang about magnifying the Lord today, and we do that. We do that with joyous hearts together. So <laughs> we're in Gospel of Luke today, Luke chapter 1. And we're starting with verse 26, and as we read God's word, you follow along as I read. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He came, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name, say it with me, Jesus, that's good. <laughs> he will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For, say this with me, for nothing will be impossible with God. you gotta say it, won't you got to say it like I mean it. Ready, say it, ready? For nothing will be impossible with God. Amen. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May God bless the reading of his word. And all God's people say amen today. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, we welcome everyone to the service today, and thank you for being a part of worshiping the Lord, whether you're here in the auditorium or perhaps you're in one of our remote locations here on campus. I know many are at home, some right here in the Sandusky area, some in various states all around the country, um, some participate together with us in um, worshiping the Lord together, and they do so uh, from their home, some uh, because of COVID, some are on vacation, some for a variety of reasons, but we are gathered in the name of the Lord and welcome. I trust you have your Bible, and you have your Bible open, because that's the focus of our attention, the Lord, His Word. We want to know it and read it and understand it. And you have noticed, of course, around the auditorium here um, that uh, it is Christmas, so Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, some work has gone into all through the buildings, not just here in the auditorium, but a sense of decoration and festivity and celebration of our Savior. Um, the decorations are not merely for aesthetics. They are for our worship. They are to point us to Jesus, our Savior. Uh, just the change of decoration from fall to Christmas is just a, a marking of the fact that we use this time of year and we do use it. We intentionally use it. It doesn't just happen to us. We intentionally celebrate Jesus 
this time of year marking his birth. And um, lots of things help us do it. Music helps us do it. Even the visuals of the decoration. All of it pointing us to Jesus. And that's what we intend to do. What Jesus taught at a table is what we've been focusing on really for quite some months now uh, on communion Sundays. We will again have communion Sunday next Sunday. Pastor Pete and I have been pointing us really to the gospel of Luke, a, a look at the life and teaching of Christ and what he taught at a table for, for many months now. We've let that be our focus on communion Sundays. Next Sunday will be another one of our lessons, Pastor Pete and I bringing us uh, what Jesus taught at a table. But essentially, it's been a look at the life and teaching of Jesus focused in the Gospel of Luke. And so for today... I think maybe we could call this uh, when Jesus was not welcome at a table, <laughs> when there was no room for them in the inn, <laughs> when he was uh, uh, presented himself in some sense with Mary and Joseph, and there was no room for them in the inn. Let's, let's let the gospel of Luke continue to be our focus on the life of Christ, because that's really been our point focusing on Christ from the Gospel of Luke. And we'll be in chapter 1 and chapter 2, but like chapter 2, verse 7 says, here, a table wasn't offered to him. Uh, there was the family looking for a place and no room for them, no place for them in the end. Famously, as a part of the story of the birth of Christ and we want him to have a place among us. We want him to have our focus. Perhaps most of you remember, of course, the seven or eight-year-old little girl, Virginia O'Hanlon, who asked her daddy, um, her papa, is there really a Santa Claus? And her papa, wanting to divert the question just a little bit, suggested that she would write into the newspaper. They lived in New York City. And uh, he suggested that, they, that she write a letter to the editors and uh, ask that question, is there really a Santa Claus? Really was a, really, uh, a little girl named Virginia, really was a daddy. And he emphasized to her that if she saw the answer in the newspaper, if she saw it in the sun, the name of the New York City newspaper, well, for sure, she could count on it being accurate. If you see it in the sun, he said to her, it's so. Well, there was an editorial written. They got the letter to the editor. She wrote the letter famously, and, and uh, the editorial board of the New York City newspaper called The Sun wrote an editorial, and in the editorial, those famous words, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. That all happened September 21st, 1897 in the New York City newspaper called The Sun. It became the most reprinted newspaper editorial in the English language. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. It became a part of the American folklore about Christmas and all that's associated with it. Uh, that famous authoritative answer in the esteemed New York City newspaper, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Some people think of the Christmas story in virtually the same way as the condescending uh, pat on the head of the little girl asking about Santa Sweet, gullible, naive, weak people believing in some fairy tale story that there was a Savior born in Bethlehem long ago and far away, and it all ends up everybody living happily ever after. 
a lot of people see the Christmas story in the same light as that editorial presented the truth of Santa. If you want to believe such a silly notion, go right ahead, naive, gullible person that you are. Wouldn't it be something if we were to wake up on Christmas morning and the esteemed New York City newspapers with all their journalistic uh, power, prestige, and authority were to print the headline, yes, Virginia, there is a God man. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> well, it would be something. Because so many today turn aside this truth and this reality that there really is a God-man and his name is Jesus. You see, we need not just the authority of the editorial board of the New York Times or whatever. We don't need their authority telling us that. Because if you see it in the Bible, it's so. There is our authority. I don't need a newspaper editorial board to tell me that it's true. I don't need a college professor telling me that it's true. I don't need the mayor of a city. I don't need the president of a country. I don't need the king or the emperor of an empire to tell me that it's true. I've got the authority of God's holy word on the subject. And, in fact, if you look at chapter 1, verse 4, let me bring you to this conclusion. Starting in verse 1, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also... Dr. Luke wrote, having followed all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Luke wrote, I want you to be certain, Theophilus. I want you to be certain, Joe or Mary or Sandy or Bill. I want you to be certain. Of what you have heard, it is true. I've written down the facts, Luke says here, that you can have certainty. This is not a fairy tale. This is not make-believe. The book of Luke was written so you could have eyewitness accounts, verifiable historical documents to give you the truth that God became man and dwelt among us. Yes, it is a miraculous story. It's not a make-believe story. It is indeed a supernatural story. It's not a stupid story. <laughs> it isn't something that could just naturally occur. No. God had to intervene in human history to make it so. This is the kind of thing only God could do. No, it doesn't make scientific sense. This story of Mary and a as a virgin get of course it doesn't make sense and it doesn't have to do you get that this is not a natural story it's a supernatural story this isn't a make-believe story it's a miracle of what God did because he has the authority and power to do it that's what we believe we, we're not looking for some scientific explanation. This is not a biology class. This is not a biology lesson. This is a, a God thing. God did what couldn't be done. Oh, well, then that must make it a fairy tale. No. 
<laughs> no. It's God being God. Acting outside of the laws of nature because he's over nature. That's what the world doesn't get. Why? Because you said it. Look at verse 37. This is, this is the key to it. For nothing will be impossible with whom? With you? No, this is not a you story. This is a God story. That's why the impossible is possible. It's supposed to be impossible because the God outside and above nature does something in nature that couldn't be done in nature. <laughs> that's the story. And that's the point. We revel in that story. The very thing that makes us look stupid to the world is the very thing that makes God look big because he is. That's the point. So yes, world. Yes, Virginia. Yes, Sue, Billy, Frank, uh, uh, whoever. <laughs> yes, world, there is a God man. If you see it in the Bible, it's so. There's the authority. So this week, uh, the next week we'll have... Um, uh, communion and go back to what Jesus taught at the table. The following week after that, Christmas Sunday, uh, we'll put these two chapters together. Chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 2. And we'll talk about the birth of Jesus foretold today. And uh, a couple weeks from now, the birth of Jesus fulfilled in chapter 2. Now, you, you could have the idea, well, pretty familiar territory here. We all know the story of Christmas. Just kind of, um, you know, I could go to sleep here. Really? I wish, I wish that was the case. I really wish that was the case. Research done just recently. Lifeway research team uh, published the statistical results of their survey. How much of the Christmas story found in the Bible could you tell from memory? Did you know, apparently from their research, only 22% could tell the full Bible story from memory. Only 22 of Americans, 22% of Americans. What is it? 31% thought that they could tell some of it but probably would miss some important details. 25% only give a, they thought they, they perhaps could give a quick overview of the story. And here, here's, this is what caught my attention. 17% of all Americans can't tell you the story of Jesus' birth. They don't know it. There's 17% of us who don't know the Christmas story. Well, that's why we come back to this. <laughs> We've got to be sure about this. We've got to know it. This ought to just ooze out of us. We are Christ ones. We are Christians. We are people who believe in and uh, admire and love and follow Jesus. We've got to know this. Cold. And apparently increasingly, generation after generation after generation, despite all of the communication tools we have, we're not passing it on well. So that's why we come back to it. Some people say, well, my goodness, every time I go to church, you're talking about the birth of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus, and that's because you only come Christmas and Easter. But indeed, here we are talking about the birth and resurrection. Okay, okay, the birth of Jesus foretold. So that's essentially what's going on here, right? Uh, Mary's being told, you're going to conceive and, and have a child. Okay, so that's, that's called prophecy, right? Let's think about with me here for a mo just a moment the place of prophecy 
in the birth of Jesus. You have the event, but what I want you to be very clear about as a church family, as a follower of Jesus, is that this birth of Jesus is something that was predicted quite literally from the first book of the Bible. So you have predictions of the birth of Christ going back to Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman would come to destroy the works of the devil. And quite literally, I could give you a very long list, and I think what you're probably seeing on the screen here is a shortened list of a very long list. For instance, Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. There's a direct reference to Jesus coming. Deuteronomy 18, we took the time to study through the entire book of Deuteronomy. And when we were at chapter 18, verses 15 to 18, God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses said, from among you. That prophet and the fulfillment of the law and all the rest would be in Jesus. And, well, we, we really covered that in Deuteronomy, and on and on and on from the book of Psalms. I hope you're very familiar with Isaiah 7, 14. A virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, the whole thing, prediction of his sacrificial death. Daniel chapter 9, the prediction of the time of his coming. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, prediction of the place of his birth. All of that and much more is an indication of the fact that God has been telling mankind For generations, generations, the Messiah is coming. Christ is coming. The anointed one, Christ, the anointed one, the promised one. There's going to be one, and here he is. The place of prophecy is that God didn't just do it. He told us ahead of time he was going to do it, then kept his word. You can depend upon him. You can depend upon what the Bible says to be true because all the way back from the very beginning, you pick any page in the Bible, it's all true. Why? God showed himself to be reliable, trustworthy in the doing of this. So this is the apex of the Bible. God becoming man didn't just happen. It happened as it was predicted through all of that time and space. People putting their reputation on the line. Here's what God's going to do. He's going to do. He's going to do. And then God did it. I want you to have that. So when in chapter 1 verse 31, Luke 1 31, when it says here, you will conceive in your womb, Mary, and bear a child. She's not pregnant yet. It hasn't happened yet. And here's the prediction from the angel. It's going to happen. Here's prophecy. (laughs) You will do this. And consequently, we have it in the context of God's predictive power to make things happen. By announcing ahead of time, In this case, in chapter 1, nine months ahead of time, the coming of the Messiah, God demonstrated a lot of things. One thing he demonstrated is that he's sovereign. He's the kind of God that is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over all of human history, for instance, to orchestrate from the very beginning that there would be a redemption, a rescue of fallen sinful man. God sovereignly orchestrated nations of people, all humanity around his divine plan and process. God's over all of it. He's over the wind and the waves. He's over the weather. He's over biology. He's over psychology. He's over sociology. He's over all. He is sovereign. And the ability to make happen what he predicted happened is indicated in this passage. His omnipotence is evident in that he can do what you and I can't do. His omnipotence, he has all power to do as predicted, to do the impossible, to do the supernatural. 
He's indicating his graciousness that he would take a fallen humanity and redeem us. His compassion and love and mercy and justice. All of that and, and a continued long, long, long list, even more, that's indicated by virtue of Jesus being born here and the predictive nature of it coming to pass. God would see that what is right is done. That's justice. God sovereignly, omnipotently bringing justice to the world in the person of himself. The God-man, Jesus Christ. That's justice. That there would be a heaven and that there would be a hell is justice. You don't have justice without both, heaven and hell. And Jesus is the answer for your ability to not be in hell forever and your ability to be with him in heaven forever. That's justice, that's compassion, that's love, that's mercy, that's grace, all of it. And all of it is celebrated in the coming of Jesus. Well, let's look at four main characters in chapter 1. It kind of starts out here in our reading in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So, first main character. Here's Gabriel. And if you back up just a few verses to verse 19, it says, And the angel answered him, Zechariah, uh, speaking about the fact that his wife is going to uh, have a baby and all the rest. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to, what's the word? Speak. So Gabriel's the speaker. So Gabriel doesn't make it happen. Gabriel's merely the messenger. He's the speaker. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this. What did he bring them? Good news. Good news. Your wife's going to have a baby. That's, a good, that's good news in, all the time, isn't it? Your wife's going to have a baby. That's just that's plain good news. Amen? Although in America, we're not having babies anymore. We don't have the time for it. They're, they're inconvenient. They're costly. We're not having babies anymore. Well, that's just too bad because babies are good. We ought to still be having babies. Well, that's a different subject. Anyway, this is good news. Have a baby. That's wonderful. Married people, by the way. Men, one man, one woman. I don't have to go over that with you, do I? One man, one woman, for life. Have a baby. Great news. He was sent to speak this good news. This is prophetic. This is supernatural. Can't happen just another way. We're doing something here that uh, she's barren. She's you know going back here to Elizabeth and, and all. She, it's in, impossible. We're here to try to make a point that God's doing something supernatural. Not only is he going to do something supernatural there, there and there's going to be Mary and all the rest. So Gabriel is sent to speak this word prophetically. And um, I'm illustrating the fact that, that not only can I do it with, uh, a woman who can't have babies, <laughs> but I'm going to do it with a woman who, well, according to common society, she's not married yet, shouldn't have babies. Well, so, wow, God, God's just, uh, he's at work here. And that's the point. Here's the speaker, here's the angel sent to give the message. Well, then we come down to Elizabeth. She's the next one on our list here. And um, Elizabeth in verse, what is it, 42, if we skip down there. Uh, verse 41, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry. That's where I'm getting my thing. Uh, Gabriel was the speaker, and Elizabeth gets to be the shouter. She's exclaiming with a loud cry. I'm looking around the, uh, the chapter there for something I could say with an S. So there we go. She's out there shouting, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So here's Elizabeth recognizing the supernatural work of God in uh, what comes to be Mary coming to her. And, and this, interesting, isn't it? that uh, she's recognized the 
personhood uh, of not only the baby leaping in her room. It's not a fetus. It's not merely a clump of cells. It's a baby, right, in her womb, leaping at the recognition of the baby in Mary's womb. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord, a person inside the womb, a person. So here's the sanctity of human life from even the Christmas story right here. The Supreme Court has a wonderful opportunity to right a wrong in the United States of America with the decision. They just heard the oral arguments you heard just a few days ago. They could make this right. It's been a terrible injustice. It's been a stench to our country since 1973 that we've legalized abortion. It needs to be changed. They ought to do it. Praise the Lord for what seems like the potential of kinds of justices sitting on the bench at the moment. Praise the Lord for presidents that put them there, that have a sense of the sanctity of human life. I'm praying, and we should be praying, that God would bring about this for the good of our country. Here we have Elizabeth, the shouter. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Number three, Mary. Mary, in verse 38, what does she call herself? And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. I don't know if she was a teenager. She probably was fairly young, it, just in normal custom of the day. The Bible doesn't give it her age, but uh, in custom of the day, uh, we're, we're assuming she was a young lady. You might not expect such wisdom might not expect such courage. You might not expect such wonderful response. But here, if you read her response, that magnificent that Pastor Pete referred to beginning in verse 46 through the end of the chapter, here's her song of praise. Oh, the maturity. Oh, how God worked in her heart as well as her womb to bring her to this place as the servant of the Lord. Behold, here's her immediate response to what God is doing. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. There is the fertilization and conception of the God-man. You will conceive and bear a child. And she says, behold, here I am. I'm your servant. Do whatever you want. And in that moment, God conceived in her the God-man. It was the generation of God. It was the supernatural act of God. It wasn't a, a sexual experience. It was a supernatural experience. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Biologically, God simply created it in her. And then used the natural course, uh, course of childbirth to bring into human existence the fully God, fully man person named in the text, you will call his name Jesus. Mary said, here I am. Is that what you say whenever God calls you to something, some task? Whenever God puts a requirement on you from the very words of Scripture? Is that what we always say to him? Oh, sure, Lord, I'm your servant, just whatever you say. Is that your automatic response? Wow, is all I can say. Wow. You know, any doctrine in the Bible can and has been twisted, misunderstood, misrepresented, miscommunicated including what happened to Mary. There is a worldwide religion that has gotten Mary wrong on many accounts. For instance, there are some false notions concerning Mary that you need to be aware of. False notions concerning Mary. One is the immaculate conception of Mary 
the teaching is that she was immaculately conceived, born without a sin nature. And that's simply wrong. That is not true. The Bible does not teach that anywhere. That's simply false doctrine. She was not, the immaculate conception in this false religion is not the immaculate conception of Jesus. It's the immaculate conception of Mary. Mary was not immaculately conceived. She was not conceived without a sin nature. She had a sin nature just like you do and just like I do. That's a false teaching. They also teach that she not only had no sin nature, but that she continued then to live sinlessly. And that's simply wrong. We admire many things about Mary, but we should not do <laughs> what others have done to say of her what is not true of her. She did not live sinlessly. She needed a Savior just like you need a Savior. And just like I need a Savior. They also teach that she was perpetually a virgin. And that's just simply not true. In fact, the Bible even specifically says in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, that she had other children and their names are given. James and Judas and Simeon and Joseph. I mean, they're named. She did not, when after Jesus was born, she and Joseph continued in natural marital relations and children were born. They teach that she was bodily assumed, didn't die, but just was assumed up into heaven. That's simply wrong. The Bible doesn't say that. They're giving to Mary attributes of deity, and that's just wrong. They even call her a co-redemptrix, that she somehow cooperated in the act of redemption. It's just simply wrong. We honor her. We don't worship her. We got to get that right. That's critical. It's not just incidental. Let's move to our fourth and primary character, Jesus. We've had the speaker, the shouter, the servant, and now the... There we go. See? The Savior. And this whole thing is all about Jesus. You will call his name... Jesus, the saving one, the one who will save. It's not an arbitrary name. It's not an accidental name. It's the intentional name that they were given to call him because of who he is and what he would do. Oh, what glory that we would worship him and that we would use the name, the divine name given to him that would indicate he is the Savior of mankind. Jesus is that. That's exactly what, at least chapter 2, verse 11 says, from, uh, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You will call his name Jesus because that's who he is. Christ would be an indicator of his anointed one, his promised one, the Messiah one, the saving one, the promised one. That's Jesus Christ. Christ. You ought to know the true doctrines about Jesus. It's important to know the false doctrines about Mary. It's very important to know the true doctrines about Jesus. For instance, what we're seeing here is the virgin birth of Jesus. All of these things are commonly scoffed at by scholar and skeptic alike. But they're true. The virgin birth. Yes, it's impossible. Biologically, nobody's trying to make the point that it could happen biologically. Of course, not in the normal course of things. But supernaturally, in the sovereign will of God by which he would give us a sinless Savior, you had to have a Savior born without a sin nature, without Adam, without the first Adam, and the sin nature passed on from Adam. So without Adam's involvement, male, 
Jesus could be born of a virgin, 100% human, without inheriting the sin nature. That's what God's doing in having this virgin birth. He would therefore then be sinless, both in his nature and in his actions. And as these verses would indicate to us, verses 32 and 33, what would it be say of him? Here's the description. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. There's deity. Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He wouldn't just merely be the king. He would be the king of kings. And how long is his reign going to last? And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, forever. He must be eternal. And indeed, he is eternal. He is the God-man. That is the story of Christmas. Don't leave out the parts and pieces. You, you know, we, you summarize a lot of things in a one sentence or one phrase. or one, but, but this story is deserving of the details. Deserving of the details. Deserving of details that you need to know. And to be able to articulate in order to give an answer for the hope that is within you. So we rehearse together the reality and the miracle of the God-man, Jesus Christ. It begs the question, have you ever truly repented of your sinfulness and received the gift of eternal life from Jesus? It, it begs the question, that would be your next step. Have you ever fully recognized who Jesus is and received the gift that only he can give. John 3, 36 puts it this way. Whoever believes in the Son, the Son of God, as he's listed here, the Son of the Most High, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Here's justice. Life, heaven, or hell. Which will it be for you? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. For God to be just, there has to be a hell. For God to be just, there has to be a heaven. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life that you could have eternal life from him. Jesus is the only one who has that gift to give. It's Christmas time. We practice gift giving in following the tradition of the wise men coming to bring their gifts in homage and worship of the newborn king. When somebody gives you a gift, you don't turn around and try to pay for it Oh, that must have cost you 25 bucks. Here you go. No, a gift is a gift. It's free. Because the giver has the gift and then wants to give it to you. You just simply receive it. That's real Christmas. <laughs> receive the gift. He has the gift of eternal life because of who he is and what he did. He can give it to you. He offers it to you out of his love and mercy and compassion. Would you receive it? I didn't say, would you pay for it? Would you earn it? I said, would you receive it? Would you believe that he has that gift to give and receive it from him? Believingly. That's what it means to be saved. To fully respond to the Christmas story. We pray that that would be your response, my friend. You may not think of yourself as a Bible character like Mary or Elizabeth or any of the ones that are held up for the noble things and the responses to the Lord. But you too, like Mary, could say to the Lord, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Mary was special. She was given a special responsibility, yes, of course. But you are you, 
And God has a special responsibility for you that you have the privilege of doing for him. Would you say to the Lord today, you want me to be a shouter or I'll be a shouter. You want me to be a speaker or I'll be a speaker. But I will be the servant you want me to be. Would that be your heart toward the Lord today? Would you commit to telling someone the true story of Christmas? Sometime this month, we've turned our attention already here early in the month of December toward Christmas. There's going to be a chance. You will have a chance, almost inevitably, to tell somebody the story of Christmas. Would you be able to? Would you be willing to? Will you have the courage to? No, I'm not trying to tell you to do it on the clock at work, you know, when you should be working. I'm not trying to tell you to, uh, you know, to get in trouble for it or something. Uh, on the break time, or what, I don't know how, what the atmosphere is at your work or at your school, walking up and down the hallways of your school, or, or you know, exactly what the relationship it is between you and your neighbors, but sometime, somewhere, would you pray and ask the Lord, give me a chance to stay. Tell the Christmas story. Let me put it in my words. But use the words of Scripture. Describe the uniqueness of this birth. The uniqueness of Christ, the one and only Savior of the world. Let somebody know from your lips. It's one thing for, you know, some missionary or some pastor or some preacher. Or somebody. It's one thing for that. But Will anybody hear the Christmas story, the true Christmas story, that apparently 17% of Americans don't know? Will anybody hear the Christmas story from your lips with its ramifications and, let me just say, with its invitation to come to Jesus? Will they hear it from you this year? Lord, give us a heart for that. Give us the desire for that. Help us to know your word, to be able to speak the truth of your word. Help us, Lord, toward all of that. Help us to be able to help others to know you because they've heard of you from us. May we all be your ambassadors. May we all have that sense that we are eager to tell that story. If, if people don't know it, it won't be because of us. We're, we're going to do our part to let others know. Lord, help us toward that, I pray. Help us to be your speaker of the truth. And Lord, if there's anybody here today that's never been saved, that today would be the day that you cause them to have faith in you, that they would respond in repentance and faith in you and create in us the true meaning of Christmas, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And you will call his name what? Jesus. Jesus. Blessed be your name. This is, this is a, a, a truth front to back. Genesis to Revelation. Let's stand together and bless the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name.
shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of your government, there shall be no end upon the throne of David from this time forth and forevermore. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And say with me, amen, amen, amen.